Google stock is on a tear after having their big I.O. conference. This is where they talked about, what do you know, artificial intelligence. And they mentioned artificial intelligence more than just a few times. AI, 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 generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, 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 it uses AI to bring AI, 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 AI. This was all about AI and Google showing that they're not gonna let Microsoft run away with the AI crown. And you have to give it to them, it's working. Google stock is up to $117 per share. It's actually gone on a great run after this conference. Year to date, Google stock is up 31%, and even this week, it's up another 8.67% after mentioning AI over 100 times. So a lot of investors are once again excited about Google. But we're gonna be looking at this conference and highlighting some of the creative ways that Google's wrapping AI into all their various products. Some of them seem pretty cool. Now we also have Disney at the same time reporting their earnings, and investors did not take it too well. Even though Disney beat their revenue and earnings per share estimate, they lost subscribers. For the second consecutive quarter in a row, they shed more subscribers. And Disney as a company is facing a lot of complex operational challenges. So we're gonna be going through looking at their earnings report, seeing if we can make sense of it. And we'll be looking at some interviews where we can get some context to some of the challenges Disney faces. So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode, a lot to cover. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel and you've hit the bell icon that is completely free and you get alerts whenever I upload. Now what we're looking at here is the passive income portfolio. This is my primary investment account that I've tracked publicly so you can look back at any historical video on this channel. What I plan on doing is trying to beat the market by concentrating into a couple positions. Companies that I think will compound at a rate faster than the market average. And we can take Google as an example here. A lot of investors might be lost in trying to gauge the intrinsic value of a company, but there's a couple indicators that I think are a very good representation of it. The first thing is the revenue of the company. Generally speaking, the more revenue a company has, the more the intrinsic value goes up. Pretty basic, as Google has grown its revenue, the intrinsic value has also grown of the company. But revenue is in and of itself, not the most important thing because revenue is not a measurement of profitability. Earnings per share is a measurement of profitability. The EPS of a company is a great indicator of the intrinsic value of a company. As Google's earnings per share have also gone up, the intrinsic value of the company has gone up. We look at the earnings per share last year and they were $4.59 per share compared to back to 2002 when it was only four pennies. When a company goes from four pennies in EPS to over $4, the intrinsic value of the company has grown. But I believe even better than the revenue and earnings per share is looking at the cash flows of the company. The best indicator overall of looking at the intrinsic value growth of a company is their free cash flow per share, netting out their stock-based compensation per share. I call this the adjusted free cash flow per share. And what we see is intrinsic value growth over time of these great companies. With Google, we see a similar trend here. They've gone from eight cents in free cash flow per share to last year having $3.11 in adjusted free cash flow per share. That is an incredible compounding. In the past five years, they've grown their adjusted free cash flow per share at a rate of 21.59%. And keep in mind, the adjusted free cash flow factors in the dilution through stock-based compensation. So even with Google being a highly dilutive company, issuing a lot of stock-based compensation for their employees, it's still growing its cash flows at an incredible rate, over 20% per year. So although I don't currently hold Google in the passive income portfolio, I do have a small holding of it in my growth portfolio. And Google has remained a company that I've been continually bullish on. Now let's go ahead and look at some of the things that Google's been up to. They released this big IO conference where they really hammer down all the AI integrations they're doing. And we know right now that AI is both a very real thing, but it's also a very common buzzword. Every company's wanting to get in on this AI gravy train. So let's see if what Google's doing is actually real. The first thing that they mention is using AI in Gmail. In 2017, we launched Smart Reply. Short responses you could select with just one click. Next came Smart Compose, which offered writing suggestions as you type. You remember this in Gmail, right? Where you start typing the sentence and then it fills it in with a white text. It is so accurate. A lot of times I'm, I'm typing an email and I'll be typing halfway through a sentence and it will know exactly what I'm going to type. 
So I just hit tab and fill in the rest of it. In some cases, I'll change it, but this is a feature that I've used many times. They've been used in workspace over 180 billion times in the past year alone. Consider the vastness of Google's reach. I say I've used this feature a number of times, and then they mention that it's been used over 180 billion times in the last year alone. This is the scale that Google works at. Every single thing they do, every feature they push, they have to think of it in terms of tens of billions of uses. And now with a much more powerful generative model, we are taking the next step in Gmail with Help Me Write. Let's say you got this email that your flight was canceled. The airline has sent a voucher, but what you really want is a full refund. You could reply and use Help Me Write. Just type in the prompt of what you want, an email to ask for a full refund, hit create, and a full draft appears. As you can see, it conveniently pulled in flight details from the previous email. So we have prompt generated text here. You say you want it to draft this email and then it does its initial draft. This is basically what Bard and ChatGPT do. So they're just integrating that same tech into the emails. But the way that they do it is really intelligent. Look at where they take it from here. And it looks pretty close to what you want to send. Maybe you want to refine it further. In this case, a more elaborate email might increase the chances of getting the refund. <laughs> That's got to feel good for Sundar. He's been, he's been having a tough time getting bullied around with Microsoft for a bit and having, having an audience reaction where they're clapping and he's releasing this great feature. It's got to be a good feeling. I will say I agree with the audience here. I think that this is an incredibly powerful feature. And not only that, but I also think it's practical. A lot of the things that people working in tech think is cool is sometimes not the most practical stuff. It's really deep integrated stuff that not many people are going to be able to use and it's not really that practical. But the way that they've implemented this seems very, very easy to use and very practical. Having it be able to elaborate in email is an incredible feature. One of the biggest problems in email or any text-based communication is you lack tone, you lack context. If you're too direct with an email, it can come off as rude. So having a button to elaborate the text and recreate it in different ways puts you in the role of reviewing the email, overviewing it, and seeing if it relays the proper tone and context more than actually taking time to construct the email. And I can't stress this point enough of practicality and ease of use. A better feature, a superior feature, may not have as much success because it's difficult to use. It's more complex and it's more confusing. So every single thing they do has to be simple and easy to understand. And I think once again, they nailed this aspect of it. Even if the text generation isn't the best and it's not quite as good as ChatGPT, the fact that it's so easy to use and it's already integrated into email creates a moat that's very difficult to beat for other competitors. Outside of tech and investing culture, a lot of people aren't familiar with AI to this level of it. And I think this is gonna be a little bit of a shock to a lot of people that use email day to day. Now, the next thing they go over is Maps. Google is in competition with Apple over Maps. Apple used to be way behind Google, but they've really caught up over the past couple of years. So we can look at what Google's doing to try to race ahead. Since the early days of Street View, AI has stitched together billions of panoramic images so people can explore the world from their device. At last year's I.O., we introduced Immersive View, which uses AI to create a high-fidelity representation of a place so you can experience it before you visit. Now we are expanding that same technology to do what Maps does best, help you get where you want to go. Google Maps provides 20 billion kilometers of directions every day. That's a lot of trips. Imagine if you could see your whole trip in advance. With immersive view for routes, now you can, whether you're walking, cycling, or driving. So they're calling this immersive view for routes, and it basically takes you on a journey of the route that you've outlined before you've even gone through that route. Click on immersive view for routes, and it's an entirely new way to look at my journey. I can zoom in to get an incredible bird's eye view of the ride. And, and as we turn, we get onto a great bike path. <laughs> the 
It looks like it's going to be a beautiful ride. This isn't something that's going to be available in all of Google Maps. It's limited to 15 cities by the end of this year. So this seems like something very specific to highly concentrated, dense areas where there's a huge population. You're probably not going to be able to do this across the country. Now, the next big thing that Sundar goes over is in Google Photos. And I must say, when I was watching this part of the presentation, I was thinking about Adobe. I was thinking about Photoshop and photo manipulation. A lot of what Adobe sells is tools to manipulate photos in different ways. And it seems like Google's cutting into Adobe's moat a little bit here with their updates to Google Photo. In fact, it seems like they might be cutting into their moat significantly. But let me know if you agree. We introduced it at I.O. in 2015. It was one of our first AI native products. Breakthroughs in machine learning made it possible to search your photos for things like people, sunsets, or waterfalls. Of course, we want you to do more than just search photos. We also want to help you make them better. This is a really cool feature. If you have a big library of photos, you can type in dog and it will find all your pictures with you and your dog. Or you can type in the name of someone, you can type in different objects like this, and it sorts the photos by whatever you're searching. I never thought this feature cut into Adobe's moat, but the next part I believe does. Of course, we want you to do more than just search photos. We also want to help you make them better. You can do much more with a new experience called Magic Editor. Let's have a look. Say you're on a hike and you stop to take a photo in front of a waterfall. You wish you had taken your bag off for the photo, so let's go ahead and remove that bag strap. The photo feels a bit dark, so you can improve the lighting. And maybe you want to even get rid of some clouds to make it feel as sunny as you remember it. Now, if you notice from this photo to the previous one, a lot of the clouds just simply disappeared. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like now. It looks like a sunnier day. I do have some qualms about this. Is anything going to be real after this feature is launched? We're going to alter the weather now. You're not even going to remember truly what the weather was like when you're on vacation. I realize that photos are already so edited that you can't really trust them at all, but this is taking it to a whole new level and these alterations continue on. Looking even closer, you wish you had posed, so it looks like you're really catching the water in your hand. No problem, you can adjust that. I'm gonna be able to say a couple years from now that I grew up in a time where photos were real. Where you took the photo, it didn't look that good, but that's what it was. That was the reality of the situation. What we're headed into now is a world where you can't really trust what you see. It's a pattern. You always want your kid at the center of it all. And it looks like the balloons got cut off in this one. So you can go ahead and reposition the birthday boy. Magic editor automatically recreates parts of the bench and balloons that were not captured in the original shot. As a finishing touch, you can punch up the sky. It changes the lighting in the rest of the photo so the edit feels consistent. It's truly magical. Now, of course, this doesn't replace everything that Adobe has built, but these type of photo manipulation features have to concern them a little bit. A lot of what people use Photoshop is simply making photos look better. And it looks like Google's recreating a lot of those same tools and including them in their vast bundle. Now, I'm not going to go over every feature that they announced here. They did things like coding. How would I use Python to generate the scholar's mate move in chess? And as you can imagine, Bard can now code and it can do it really well. You can type in different prompts for different code questions and it will print out the proper response. They've integrated Bard to be able to have search results now linked to the web, something that it couldn't previously do. Bard can now answer by showing you results integrated with Google Maps. Bard even integrates with Excel. You can put things in tabular format. One of the most significant integrations of this is AI into Google search. This is the primary profit driver for Google. So they have to get this right. They give an example search here, a good bike for a five mile commute with hills. In the AI powered snapshot, you'll see important considerations like motor and battery for taking on those hills 
and suspension for a comfortable ride. You'll notice how now Google search lays out more information. There's less direct links and there's more accompanying text to give you information about your search. They're using more AI to integrate into the search results themselves. And then throughout the rest of this presentation, they talk about AI in cloud and Android and all the other applications of it. They're integrating like Microsoft, AI into every aspect of their business. Now, overall, investors were pleased with this presentation and I think it's deserved. I've believed for a long period of time that Google has been undervalued. The company's up 30% year to date, so it's had a really good run. And then even over the past month, it's up another 8%. With this presentation, it jumped 8% in a matter of days. But we can't just look at previous recent performance. When I look at the valuation of Google, it's trading at a PE ratio of 17.8. That seems like a very low PE ratio for such a high quality company. The free cash flow yield, not counting stock-based comp, is 4.13%. With stock-based comp, that's closer to 3.5, which I still believe is a healthy PE for this company. So overall, I still think that Google has room to run. I would not be surprised to see this company trading at $130 relatively soon. That would put the company at around a 20 PE ratio and a little bit lower than a 4% free cash flow yield. Both of them would seem completely reasonable. So in my opinion, I still think that Google's undervalued. I think it's too good for where it's trading and I think it still has more room to run. Now, moving on from Google, we have to talk about Disney here for a minute. This company is going through a very rough patch. Investors are concerned about it. I know a lot of people are invested in this company because it's such a huge consumer facing company. It really seems almost impossible for such a massive successful company to be a poor investment. But let's go ahead and take a look at what happened here in the last quarter. Disney's streaming losses improve even as subscriber numbers decline. Investors like to focus on subscriber numbers, even when they should be focusing on the losses. So financially, the streaming losses have been better year over year, which is an improvement. But the big problem here is that Disney dropped a lot of subscribers outside of the US and in the US. We have the data right here. Wall Street expected Disney Plus subscriptions to grow less than 1% during the quarter and reach 163,170,000 users. However, the service saw a 2% decline in membership falling to 157.8 million. Now here's the caveat with that, and this is important context. The huge majority of those losses came with Disney Plus India, which is Disney Plus's hot star service. The India subscribers are worth far, far less than US subscribers. So while US subscribers are paying somewhere around seven or $8 per month, the India subscribers were only paying a dollar or less and the profit margins were terrible. So they lost a lot of subscribers that were far less valuable to the company. But even so, they also lost 600,000 subscribers in the US and Canada, and those are valuable subscribers. So no matter which way you slice it, in terms of total subscriber gain and loss, this wasn't good. Losing a lot of low value subscribers isn't the worst thing in the world, but they also lost valuable subscribers in the US. Now it wasn't all bad news. Disney posted a loss of 659 million versus a loss of 841 million the year before. So their losses are going down, which means it's headed in the right direction. And revenue overall for their subscribership rose 12% to 5.51 billion meaning that even though they're losing in volume, they're increasing in prices. So this isn't all bad, but it's also not optimal. The best type of companies are the ones that grow in both volume and in price. They can grow both ways. Disney grew in price, but they didn't grow in volume. Now I wanna dive in further to this quarter and go over the report, but I also wanna go over why I sold out of Disney. I sold Disney, you can see right here with this sell order, at around $110 per share. So just above 110, around February 9th of this year. So this is the area that I sold Disney. It was actually the high of the year so far. And there was a specific reason that I chose that date. This was a bounce and a rebound after the activist investor Nelson Peltz came into the stock and bumped up the stock price temporarily. I thought that there is a chance that this wouldn't last long. And I'd been looking for an exit to this company for some time. So I took advantage of Nelson Peltz entering the stock a quick bounce in it to exit my position. Now, Disney has since fallen down a little bit further, been a very rough past five years for this company. Over the past five years in total, it's down 10.8%. And the stock price is down now where it was during the COVID lows. So Disney's at a price of $91 per share again. Is this a phenomenal company, a high quality compounder on sale? 
or is it a company that's struggling that deserves to be trading at this price? The first thing I wanna do is do an overview of how I see Disney's business right now and the predicament that they're in. We have a pie chart here that I put together, a crudely drawn pie chart, but I think it illustrates the point quite well. Right here we have the parks. The parks is a huge part of Disney. And overall, the parks are what's really holding this operation together. When I look at Disney as a business, the parks operation generate a ton of the operating income, a ton of the profits, and they're also incredibly resilient and reliable. This is the cash printer of Disney. They have the parks, people love them, they're always packed, and they're always generating profits. There's an issue with parks, and the issue is, is that they can grow through price, but they have a very difficult time growing through volume. Parks aren't like digital software where you can sell to more and more people, so growing through volume is very difficult. When you have a park in California or Florida, you have that one park, and then it can only hold a certain amount of people. So the only way the parks business can grow is through price increases. So even though the parks are a great business, it's limited in its growth potential because they only have pricing power. And Disney has heavily leveraged their pricing power in their parks. I would say that they've almost exhausted it. If they continue to raise prices at the rate that they have, they will offend their core customers. People will stop visiting the parks because they are getting very expensive. Almost everything that Disney can monetize in the parks has been monetized. So when I look at the parks, even though they're a great money generator, in terms of growth, I don't see a lot. I don't see a lot of growth in terms of pricing power or in terms of volume. To create more parks and more experiences takes billions of dollars and years of development, and to raise prices further than now, I think is very difficult, especially if the economy is slowing down. So I don't see a lot of growth in parks. I see it as mostly a good but stagnant business. The next largest segment we have is linear television. This makes up roughly a third of Disney's overall revenue, and this part of the business is also a wonderful business in terms of its economics. It has high margins. The problem with the linear business is it's in secular decline. Every single month, they lose hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of subscribers to cable TV. Their highly profitable linear TV business is currently in decline. Then we have Disney's new growth avenue, which is streaming. We have all of their various services like Hulu and Disney Plus and Disney Hotstar. We have the ESPN apps. We have all the streaming services. This makes up over 20% and this aspect of their business is growing, both through price increases and hopefully in the future in volume. Last quarter, it didn't grow in volume. So we have a situation here where even their good business, which is supposed to be the growth driver of Disney, is not growing in volume. It grew in price, they raised the Disney Plus prices a lot, so the overall revenue went up, but in terms of volume, the amount of subscribers went down. So even the story of Disney's growth driver, which is their streaming, is running into a kink. It's turning out to be a very difficult business. So what we're working here with Disney, summarized, is an excellent but stagnant parks business, a linear TV business with excellent economics that's in secular decline, losing subscribers every single month, and then a streaming business, which is growing through price, but also losing subscribers. And this is what creates the overall story for Disney that is meh. It's just not the best story. What investors want are very clean stories where they have a very clear path to growing profits, growing intrinsic value through revenue, earnings per share, and free cash flow per share. And this makeup of a company doesn't provide investors with that clear path. In fact, looking at Disney's financials, we can take a simple glance at the cash flows, see the explosion through 2012 up to 2019, and we look at it now. Back in 2022, the free cash flows were incredibly low, a billion dollars compared to almost 10 billion in 2018. And investors are left with that big question mark. Is Disney ever going to be able to get their free cash flows back up to 2018 levels? Is that even possible? Now, I'm not trying to bash Disney. I think it's a great company. But another thing I'll mention is almost every aspect of Disney's business has become more competitive. Over the years, every single part of it has more competition than they used to. Even as good as their park segment is, there's other competitors like Universal and Nintendo building Super Nintendo World. 
It may not be as good as Disney World, but this is competition. This is outdoor experience centered around families. If we take the box office and streaming segment, they're facing significant competition here. Disney used to be the absolute boss of the box office, especially in animated family films. They couldn't be beaten. But then Super Mario Bros. movie comes around and it's a universal smash success, having over $1.1 billion in revenue. Even Bob Iger praised the rival on this huge achievement. This is Disney getting surpassed by another competitor in their own game, which is family animated media. Even with the sports segment of ESPN, they have another huge set of competitors with big tech, Amazon and Apple, bidding for sports rights, so they're going up against them as well. No matter how you break it down, every part of the company is facing more competition now than it has over its lifetime. Now to get a second opinion on this, we also have Tom Rogers who phoned in to CNBC to explain what he still believes is the biggest unknown about Disney and these other legacy media companies. And no media company today, traditional media company, can tell you whether or not the decline they are going to suffer in terms of revenues from their cable channels uh, is uh, ever going to be made up by the growth and contribution of their streaming businesses. They hope so. They're cutting costs uh, on the streaming side, as Disney indicated, taking a write down on uh, programming costs because they're going to reduce the amount of programming on their uh, programming cost on their streaming services. Uh, but uh, that's a big unknown. Uh, what we what we've seen is a uh, focus away from just the number of subs to everybody now talking about the profitability of streaming services. Well, we haven't seen anybody stand up and yet say, and this is where the focus needs to go, is how bad is the decline going to be when it comes to the traditional cable channels relative to the growth and contribution that we see uh, the streaming side able to make? Do those lines ever cross? Uh, or are we in a uh, situation where media companies will never recover to where they were based on what you said, the best media model known to man was cable? I think Tom Rogers nails the biggest question here. All of these legacy media companies are left with the same problem of having that decline in such a historically good business. Part of the reason that I sold out of Disney, but I still remain invested in Netflix in my growth portfolio, is because Netflix does not have to worry about this historical cable TV business that's in decline. All they have ahead of them is potential growth. There's no part of Netflix's core business that's in decline. So in terms of Disney's future and the stock price right now, it's tough. It's a complex story. And that's the reason that I'm not invested in the company. The true answer is, if I'm being honest, is I don't know how this turns out. I don't know if Disney will ever get back to $200 per share or how long that will take. So right now for me, Disney's in this complex basket. It's a little too hard for me to figure out. And above all, what I've been looking for in my companies, what I've been prioritizing is predictability. Predictability in the company's stories, cash flows, revenues, earnings per share. I'm looking for companies that are highly predictable on a going forward basis. The reason that I've invested so much into S&P Global and MasterCard is I think that their stories are highly predictable, both in pricing power, revenue growth, and consistency of earnings. It's the same reason I've made investments into companies like Vici, companies like Texas Roadhouse, and even the railroads. All of these companies will have some fluctuations and variation and cyclicality in their earnings, but I think in terms of overall their businesses, they're far more predictable on a going forward basis than Disney. Right now, Disney's in this flux where it's very difficult to model out the future. So Disney could currently be in a big dip and maybe outperform largely in the future, or the company could stagger along at around the same price point of $100 per share for the next three or four years. Now that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. And if you haven't already, check out the Patreon. It gives you access to Qualtrum Insights. We've made significant upgrades to it. I'm excited for you to try it out. And you also gain access to the Discord community. We have thousands of members there. We have exclusive content. We have lots of different channels where we shoot the breeze and talk about stocks and investing. So if you want to join that over the weekend as well, check out patreon.com slash Joseph Carlson.